me what I'm first. How's that? Okay. Well, I'm going to have you start by saying your name and spelling your name. My name is Thomas P. Mooney. Okay. I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota, or now it's Roseville, which is a suburb. And your serial number is? 373-10345. And the unit you served in? You served in 10 Oh, Company L, 3rd uh, Platoon, 86. Uh, as low as you can get. Huh. Private, PVT, whatever you want to call it. Got it. Yeah. And they, uh, later on at the end, you got PFC by the Act of Congress. Uh, Everybody was made a PFC. Uh, uh, when did you join the 10th Bomb? I joined them at, uh, at Swift. I wasn't in the Hale. So I joined them at Camp Swift. How did you come to join the 10th Bomb? They needed a replacement. They sent me there. And they were, other guys told me three, and they took me for nothing. It made no difference. I mean, this, they were looking for, and then I understand they were probably a little short, even figuring it in the infantry uh, outfit at 160 is a big one. Not many are that big. So we had ours at about 160, but I think when they came over here, they figured they were about 500 short. When you joined up with the 10th, did you have any idea? When I joined up to Chance, I didn't know nothing about it. You know what I mean? It's another outfit. I was in Fort Knox. I was in Chaffee, Arkansas. That's 16th Armored. Then I came to the 10th Mountain Division. And, and what did you soon enough learn? That it was a better outfit than the one I was in. <laughs> if that means anything. Why? Why? Well, the, the one I was in was, they, they were just not any good. And they irritated you, and I didn't. I got irritated very easy at that time. What did you like about the tenth? The tenth. When I first come in, I can put it this way: I'm up in the barracks, and I'm writing for a letter. And a couple of guys come in. One was a lieutenant, and a sergeant, and they said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm writing a letter." Oh, you can do that anytime. I went into Austin when they had a dance. I mean, when I was in the in the sixteenth, a PFC wouldn't talk to you. I mean, they, they were above you, you know. So like I say, they had no, but they found out that 16th Armored was uh, activated in 1941 and never got overseas until 45. It was a terrible outfit all the way through. They sent a guy from Washington, D.C. to, uh, to uh, find out why it was bad. And the real, the reason why they, they were, had to come there, they had so many court marshals. They were using day rooms for court marshalling. And so uh, one of the ones that I uh, listened to, and I still remember that, and I, I did remember guys more than that because they, I think I was there about a year. I didn't know too many guys in, in Tenth Mountain because I, I think I only spent about two, three weeks, maybe three weeks at at uh, Swift, you know, and then we, we moved out. Okay, let's, let's go. Right. Go ahead. I want to ask you, like, did you feel like the, in the 10th Mountain Division, the men and the officers were equal? Uh, you didn't see me in the officers. I mean, you had one to take you out or something. You saw your non cons more. Uh, more of the little drills was done by the non cons stuff like that, yeah. You'd see the officer, like, our captain, when you first come in, you'd go see him. He'd ask you if you do would do something. You'd say, I'd rather not. He never liked it. Everybody else did it to him. Was there a feeling among the tenth that people were friendlier? Oh, definitely. I think they weren't. Didn't give you the feeling that you were nothing. That they were above you. They were. I, I thought they were very good myself. But then some of the guys that were hailed thought they were pretty tough, and they should have been in the sixteenth. So it was a breeze for me, and I, I thought it was pretty good, nice talking. In fact, I just talked to, at the dinner the other night, um, Dylan uh, Snell, and he was a staff sergeant, and he was walking with my sergeant, and uh, I didn't even know, he was my platoon sergeant. This is how new I was in this thing. So, uh, no, it was good, and they were, he was very nice, and I asked him, Yesterday, I said, well, how about that little guy that was always following you around? I asked him his name. 
one of the guys that I did know, like Mike Fusio, he's a little Italian kid, you know. He said, well, it could have been Mike, but it could have been this other kid, and I didn't know the other kid, so. But it was, no, I think they were sociable in the tenth. Uh, it made a big difference, I think. Uh, I would say probably uh, they were a heck of a lot more educated. I was but the dummy, high school. Most of them were either a couple of years of college or something like that, and a lot of them come from the east, which is college anyway. That's where the skiers come from. New York, Connecticut, all the hills out there, you know, and the colleges, Dars Mountain, all those kind of schools. Yeah, they were, uh, and they come in, you know, at the last reunion I was at, my lieutenant come up, he was wounded on, uh, right away down there. So he came up to a reunion, and I, I said to him, I said, who was that little uh, blonde kid that was, nice looking blonde kid? He said, that was, that was uh, Johnson over there. Johnson had gray hair that didn't look very good. He had a mustache, and he, all he says, I wish I had that blonde hair again. That's all he said. Um, would you say that the guys in the tent had sort of shared sense of identity, or shared bond? I would say they were, uh, well, I think with your your uh, lower uh, divisions of the uh, thing, I think they were better with them than they were. I, I'm associating with them with 16th Armored Division. Anybody would be better. In fact, uh, they even had it on Waller Winchell. You probably never heard of that guy. And he says, uh, uh, somebody... Dad must have a lot of money because he got on that radio and he says, talked about the hellhole in the United States, 16th Armored Division. And another big item, we had, had uh, uh, went into the Chaffee, Arkansas from the post. And uh, there was another guy named Mooney, you know, Ray Mooney from Boston. I seen him, I hollered, Ray. MPs picked us both up, and we, we get thrown in, disturbing the peace, thrown in the, in the jug, you know. And at 1 o'clock, they take you back to the camp. We get in, we, we're in a, a barrack sleeping, and an officer came in and woke us up. He says, we had to go take a pro. And Ray Mooney was about 30, you, oh, he, he read him off like nobody, he says, I haven't seen nothing in my life, and he says, for talking, he says, I'm going to have to go take a pro. He said, you go to hell. He said, we wouldn't go. But we had to go over there. It's, it was stupid. Well, what, what was the most difficult time that you remember? Pardon? What was the most difficult time or thing that you remember? Uh, I, I would say that year I spent in 16th Armored. How about in the 10th Mountain I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the guys in which we called it. The training is always the same. I mean, it's not the same because you're... Your non comes in the 10th were there, and your non comes in the 16th would take you out to an area and see um, your uh, armored force had a, what you call cadre, teachers. And the, the non comes would march you out to this place. If there was a PX near it, they'd be in the PX, or they might be playing cards. So they wouldn't get to know because. These guys that take you through all the machine guns and what some calls all the different weapons, mortars, and for instance, if you had to move from one to the other, you could probably move in pretty well. But uh, How about during battle? Was pardon? The most difficult thing you remember during battle? I was the most difficult thing was move out because you're moving from one spot, you never know what's in front of you. That's what I would say. That was the most difficult. Once you got going, you just kept going, and that's it. What were you thinking when you were moving on into the unknown? Well, you were, you were, it's the unknown. You, you were thinking, and you had to keep your eyes ahead pretty well because you didn't know. Actually, one of the things that probably scared you the most was one time, like in, you're in a Po Valley, and you're going from hedge road to hedge road. There's a row here, and then you got a, a big section for farm, corn or whatever they're going. And then another set of trees. Well, when you get to the other set of trees, that's when you get a little worried. You saw what's kind of in front and on the front lines. So then you start worrying when you get to set. And, and this one place, I don't know where it was, 
a guy jumps out and, and everybody hit the ground. Rifles pointing at the guy and fortunately he didn't get shot, but he hollered, I'm from Iowa. <laughs> it was it was comical. <laughs> Of course, everybody said just, but what the hell are you doing here, you know? Well, he went over to, uh, to um, visit his folks probably over there, and then he couldn't get no travel back home. So he said he's been here for, was there for a year, a year and a half already, see? So, uh, but that was comical. Uh, I'm from Iowa. And we, to we, we told him, look, you go stay. Don't ever come out and meet another bunch of soldiers. You don't know. Fortunately, he didn't get shot at with us, but you could have. Everybody could have probably shot him. But that's, and even the other places you expected, if you run into fire, you'd expect that. But I think the, the biggest scare we got was later on in the pole, and we're walking, and we're ahead of schedule. These uh, airmen, they, you got a line, and if you get over that line, they fire. Well, then they come and they fire on us. And when we see them, I'm in the, in the truck, and we saw them, they're flying beautiful because we well, looked at them how nice they looked. They just washed all those planes nice, shiny in them. And all of a sudden, they start to dip. And when they start to dip at 25, 30 miles an hour, we were getting off that truck already. And we got to, the kid finally stopped, and we hollered, get in the ditch, get in the ditch. And then if they come over, you can say on one side, the bullets will hit in the ground, the ground kills them. Anytime you can get protection in the ground, you take the ditch and you cover it up pretty well. So uh, they, uh, they got in and, and uh, we fired. We had a little uh, chubby little girl uh, come out to me. She might have been 11 or 12. You, you know how they are when they're little or they're, they don't, lose a lot of that baby fat, yeah. Well, anyway, she'd come out to meet us, and here they were coming. We had to grab her and pull her back in a, the ditch with us, you know. And her mother and dad were sitting on the door over there. I could see that waiting, looking for uh, the kids. But uh, that, was, that was scary. Nobody got hurt, fortunately. But the one thing was we had a, a new lieutenant that was green, and he never told us what he... He had, so he was pulling up smoke bombs and not looking and, and throwing. So this Jack Fellman was uh, was uh, in our squad there, and Jack says, what are you looking for? Yellow. Jack gets in and gets the yellow, throws it up. Only seven of them straight for us. The rest would come by. Okay, this is uh, part two with Thomas Moody. Yeah, okay. what, what do you got now? I want you to go ahead and when, I, when I go too far, just stop me. You can ask another question. Okay. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what, what the fighting was like on Belvedere? Uh, Belvedere, I was more or less Monica Terrazzo, the 86th. So that is up higher in the mountains, probably. Belvedere Mountain went all the way up. But, and it was bad on Belvedere, but uh, Terrazzo was pretty rough, too. Tell me about it. Well, what can you say? You get a lot of, a lot of uh, mortar fire. You got uh, um, heavy tank fire and stuff like that, and and small arms fire. It was you're moving into their territory, just like if you ever saw shows where the Indians come in years ago. They come in and you're in all buckle up somewhere in the rocks and caves and that, you know. So uh, it was it was not light. Actually, I don't think, I think after that Monica Terrazzo, I think they fill up every uh, hospital they had here. It was uh, so many, there were so many knocked out. Fortunately, I never got hit. Thank you. That was a, but they were, like I say, in that first shot that we had, we ended up with only five guys out of 13. Oh, it's, it was rough. <laughs> what happened to the other? The what? What happened to the other seven? Well, either a killer or wounded. Yeah. You had 499 uh, guys killed, you know, and you got millions of wounded. It was just, they were taking them down left and right.
<laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was, <laughs> pardon me, it, just wasn't, it was not good. Well, you were lucky. I was very, very lucky, all the way through. Did you feel like, um, well, I got to the, I got to the point, after a while you forget it, you didn't give it on. They tell you to move on, you moved out. If you thought of it, you went nuts. Some of the guys did go nuts. Um, bro break down, you know, and stuff like that. But you just had to not think about it. If, if I'm going to go, I'm going to get hit. What are you going to do? That's the way it was. You went out, a bunch of guys, they're up there, they're shooting at you, and you're moving towards them. You just kept after them, you see. Did you think... Uh... <laughs> How random it was that it could be one person and not the person next to him? Uh, it was lucky it could be the guy right next to you. Right, you never know. But like I say, I was the first scout. And then when they said move out, you moved out. You never paid no attention. You you had to, you forgot about what's what's in front. You just kept going, see. What does the first scout do? The uh, first scout tries to see what's out there for it and, and give a, a what's it called, but they always send a leader out, and that's, we have two scouts, and then you have whoever is running the squad, whether a lieutenant or a sergeant, is probably, and he'll, according to what happens, he'll deploy them in, see? So but you see it. things first, that's first? Well, I mean, I, I don't, nobody sees things first. You're there first. But I actually think that They'd probably let you go and get the rest done. <laughs> it must have happened. That's the way I looked at it. Really? Well, I mean, uh, well, what are you doing? Uh, I, uh, right in the North Central uh, uh, unit, that's Min uh, Northwest Minneapolis, St. Paul, Wisconsin. <laughs> but five or six of the guys were scouts. First of all, you are the first man out. You'll see, all right, let's move up. First one goes out. You have an interval of maybe 50, 60 feet between the first and second. Then maybe about 75 feet between the, the second scout and the, the squad, you know. And I suppose that works up and down the line all the way through. Maybe, actually, you never ever see the big boys. But they all had a go on the push. Everybody was in on the push. Cooks. Everything, they all closed out, everybody had to move on. But during the other times, you just, uh, you know, just go out and, uh, and um, till you get stopped. And, or also, if they give you a spot that they want you to check on, you went out till you checked on that. So, and then they'll stop you. If, they, if they're going to have you stop at night, then you, you take a foxhole. And um, sometimes you might be in the same place for a couple of days. They want you to go. You take, I don't know what division it was going in Blog. No, we're going to go there tonight. But I was talking to a kid that was in there, and he said it was raining for so long, but he said they were held up for, for over a month and a half because they had to wait till we broke open the, uh, that section there. If they, if they went too uh, quick, the Germans could get behind them and, and take care of them. So they had to wait till we got in an even line with them, see? That's what he told me. So he said, they stayed there for about a month and a half in one spot. What was it like when you were crossing the Pro? Well, this is when, uh, the Pro, it was beautiful. When you come in and you, you go through the Apennines with nothing grew, it was, all it was is rock. If, if they had a little space, like that little pot, these people plant some kind of vegetable in there. But you get down and uh, uh, look down from the, you're talking about the river now, not uh, crossing the river. We went over on boats. And it wasn't too bad. It, uh, some of them got fired on, some of them didn't. But uh, we went over and we got orders to uh, stop before we crossed the pole. And, when they got that order, we were 35 miles on the other side. <clears throat> Once you get them going, you never stop. You got them on a run, you just keep going. It's because if they let them set up, you don't want them to set up. So that's just about what it was. All right, now you got me to the pole. Then we went into the Alps. 
walking into the Alps we went to an artillery barrage. And I think we did it very well. Hold your position. In other words, 50, 60 feet apart. And somebody up ahead of me, it blew, I don't know how he come out, but he went flying through the air, you know, he got, with the blast just threw him up and he's down. So you just kept going. And when we got to the, say about 30 feet from the mountains, we all run to the mountains. They can't drop them down. So it was, uh, I would say, uh, that was a scary thing. Because you know they were lining the, the shells in your area. Well, now we come to this, one of the big things on that was, um, we went through the tunnel. We got there and they, we sat till everybody caught up and he said, let's go and we marched through the tunnel. That's the road. They cut through the mountains, you know. And so we get to the other end of this tunnel and we start to come out and the kids jumped a gun. And they fired, uh, uh, Germans fired. So we zip back in the tunnel. We go all the way back to the other side. And we had... Uh, Pardon? Well, oh, you're not trapped because you can always get out the other side. You you took care of the other side. So anyway, uh, went there like that for quite a while, and there was a trap. Yes, there was 75 killed in that tunnel. Uh, they threw an 88 in that, that tunnel and blew it up. But in the in the meantime, before that happened, we had a kid named Harris, and I tell you, he was cracking up. And we were sitting on the side of the mountains and. And he'd run back in the tunnel, and then he'd come out, and film it and watch, watch. He'd get up to go, film it and say, five minutes, five minutes, he'd be coming out again. And fortunately, he made it just before that, the next, got out and the next thing hit that. And there were 75 try, killed, a lot of wounded in there. But an 88 is, they can fire it like a rifle. And they did fire at an individual. That's a big, big what's name, you know, coming out of there. But. They were, you were worried about. I mean, let's face it. They uh, they got cal 30 calibers on the bottom, 50s on top, and they got the big gun. And they can fire that as they end up. This is where uh, the same place uh, we got through this, though, at another spot where uh, Darby got killed. You probably read about Darby. He was terrific. Uh, officer. He's not, he had to be right out there with you. Two, two scouts and then Darby would be there to push him around, you know. And he said, <clears throat> on this one time he asked for any tanks and the headquarters, there's no tanks up ahead. He says, I want two any tanks and they bought him. I'd say we went two miles and boom. He didn't knock two or three of them off. That our anti-tank was terrific. They, we had that, that, uh, and they'd come about 45 miles an hour. They saw it, they'd rush about 45 miles an hour down that road and, and they could shoot that big, big gun, you know, 90s they had on there. And if they dipped in the road, that gun stayed, it was gyrosmatic or something like that. And it, it just stayed at, where you wanted it, and he, uh, well, he could kill there. Him and uh, the guy who was with well, his whole outfit was killed at Anzio, you know. That uh, they were not uh, infantry outfit; they were all trained in for infantry, but they were m more like the raiders. Remember, they'd come in on a spot, hit it, and pull out. You know, that's what they were trained for. But then on Anzio, you're just another infantry man. You had a section over there and stuff like that, and they they blasted that Anzio bad, them guys. Out of all the different offensives that you were on, what really stands out from beginning to end? Well, what st stood out the most was, okay, I'm going to get you. We get to uh, walk all the way to Riva. That's on the end of the Lagarda, the town. And then we, from there we left and went by truck to Arco. That's somewhere up in the mountains up there. And then we're all getting ready for a big night. 
shaving, and the little gals are giving us a little hot water and stuff like that, you know. And, and, and what does he do? We had to go up to through the Barren Pass, a truck. And for some reason or other, three of Mooney and Thelma and Cornelison always seemed to get in that thing. Either he didn't like us or he got us in there. But we got in that truck, and we went through the Brenner Pass, and we got up. Um, Ensenbrook is the town that's closer to that. It's a big ski resort. And we come up there with 20 guys, and there must have been 4,000 Germans there. And you, you wonder, well, nothing happened. We thought we were captured. Or wouldn't, so we just had the guy back it up, and we just went back. So I was a little teed off when I come back. I went to the captain. I said, what the hell did you send us up there for? He said, he got orders from headquarters or someone to find out if there's any Germans up ahead. <laughs> Fortunately, they had their guns, but it was called off about the third. On the fifth, it was, they start passing their guns back in. That's the end of my story, and I think that's uh, where they go from there. I didn't. You know, uh that Burner Pass, when you, when you were up to Innsbruck, were you all surprised? Was I surprised with the holes? It took us about three hours to get around. You had to drive around the craters, yeah. And it took a long time to get through that thing. Were you surprised at how many Germans there were? Whoa, boy, were we surprised when, when you pulled up there and you seen them. You looked out, and that one kid, I think he came from that, uh, uh, we used to call it a searchlight parade. They used to light up our front lines at night. And this one kid went out to grab a Luger from the guy, and the guy just held his hand there. He wouldn't get him. Myself and, and uh, Fellman run out and grabbed the kid and get back in that damn truck. And uh, so then we got in, and we said to the driver, get us out of here. And they, they didn't stop us because it was over, thank goodness. <laughs> but they never would have shot at you anyway, because what's their, unless they wanted to. You were a prisoner, whether you wanted it. Twenty guys aren't going to do anything, you know. But they're all carrying these, these burp guns and Tommy guns, and and it was and that three-story building. There were three Germans to every window, and the courtyard was loaded. I'm just, I just give a. But who was the prisoner there? We would have been. When, there was no prisoner. We would have been if they wanted us. I mean, there was no going to be no argument. No, that was the. And that's the far, I don't know what the hell happened and if we went forward or where we come back, you know. But that was it. That was the, the last. And like I say, the headquarters to me was, I was always figuring them as stupid. But <clears throat> uh, they would do something just like, and I was right next to uh, Darby when he, he called for those tanks. And, and he says, those guys sit up there and they figure they know everything. He says, they're not getting a feedback from probably their intelligence or uh, that there's tanks, but they, the tanks can hide, especially they're maybe getting a, t a cave or something like that, and they can come out. And that's that was uh, that was a rough spot there. They did fire them things that uh, I'll never forget. I when they started firing them, I ran over into a building. I had a pint of whiskey that was sent from the home. They put it in a loaf of bread, you know. And I opened it and I took a shot of it and I set it on a on a, a dresser in this one room and I come out and I come back to go get it and this kid is wiping his mouth. He says, "What well, was that years old? That thing was gone. That wasn't even funny. <laughs> but I wasn't a whiskey drinker and I'm a beer man, so it didn't make much difference. But it was that's all I know. No, but I I to look at it and to know him, yes. I mean, I was right next to him yeah, about four times. He was running task forces, what he's doing with us. And when he took a task force, he was the boss. No matter what they said here or said there, he was the, the commander of that thing, you know. He was, and he was a, a, a good guy, and he was, a, he was one that never, I suppose he trained his guys that way, no, that he would be taking the same jobs as they would do, you know. He was a good soldier. But well, he wouldn't ask you to do anything he wouldn't do. Well, if he had to if he's that close. He said, There's no argument there. Well, I think he got enough. I think I went through all as far that as was I went. very good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I met him and his.
I met him and his wife at at uh, it was probably Sun Valley or one of the things, and and uh, he's coming by, so I had him stop and take a picture. I don't know why I never take pictures, and he couldn't let him come out. So, so, uh, but he uh, Ben has stopped and talked to anybody. He was a, a really him and what's the name, and they were good friends. Uh, Dylan Snow was, uh, was a, and Ben Duke were very good friends. And they're both, like I say, you felt like you, you know, women could do anything you want. I mean, some place, like I say, in the 16th, uh, a PFC had. Then it, uh, all that does is get your honor up. But th these are good. They were terrific guys. Then we got our little captain left, and we got shoes. They, we call them shoes. Schumacher was his name. He had five sixteen, size sixteen feet. You know, <laughs> like these basketball. Well, these basketball players. Some are twenty. Do they even have shoes for size sixteen? Anybody got a match?